Hi guys, thanks for joining us. Welcome to the Three Pillars podcast with your host Griselda Barreto. Today we'll be speaking on the second pillar of writing. Hi Cynthia, welcome to the Three Pillars. How are you doing? I'm doing well, thank you, Griselda. How are you doing? Oh, I'm doing great. Uh, it's what? It's eight in the evening here, so it's pretty calm. It's a bit windy outside, and everything's fine. How's the weather there? It's windy here too, and cloudy, and oh. but it's not raining at the moment. Okay, great. Um, so before we begin, Cynthia, could I ask you to introduce yourself to our listeners to just give a short, you know, background of who you are and things? Well, sure. Thanks. Um, my name is Cynthia McGregor. I'm a freelance writer and editor. I'm the author of over 100 books. I do all kinds of writing, magazine articles, writing for clients, writing blog posts, ghost writing books, you name it, just about everything except I don't do grant proposals. That's a very specialized type of writing that I'm not familiar with. And when people ask me to, uh, they want to hire me to do grant proposals, I tell them that I, I'm sorry that I don't do that. But I do just about any other kind of writing for clients. And I also edit. Again, I'll edit anything from, um, well, all the way up to a book. But from a blog post, I have one client who has me edit her blog posts before she puts them up. I have, uh, you name it, I'll edit just, just about anything. So you've got a lot of experience in writing, so we're going to ask you for loads of advice. You just mentioned, though, Cynthia, that you've written over 100 books. I think that's a remarkable achievement. But tell me, is there a downside to having that many books published? Well, the downside, Criselda, is very simple. Because I don't write all on one subject, for example, I don't write all parenting books or all inspirational books, and I don't write novels. Um, I've written two novels, but I don't basically write novels, so it's not like I write romances or mysteries. With one type of book, uh, one genre, whether it's mysteries or whether it's parenting books or how-tos or science, whatever it is, you get a following, you get an audience, you get a platform. People who follow you because they like your writing and your subject and your style. But because I'm all over the place, uh, I don't have as much of a following as I would if I were specializing in one particular genre. So that's the downside. I've written a lot of books, but I don't have as many people following me as I would have if it were, if, if I were specializing in one genre. Uh, but what about book marketing and things like that? Wouldn't that help to a certain degree? Well, it helps to a certain degree, but it's not its not foolproof. It's not fail-safe. Mm. Uh, so when did you start writing? I mean, you, you've written over 100 books. I'm presuming it's in a course of many years. But when did you actually publish your first book? I wrote my first book in 1993. Oh, wow. So, yeah, that's quite... And, and how was your journey? Tell us about your start to your writing journey. What was it like and how did you get into it? Well, it's like this, Griselda. I was a freelance editor back then, too, and my primary client was a magazine publisher for whom I edited all the magazines that his company put out. And they put out occasional one-shot magazines. By one-shot, I mean something that they just did one issue of that wasn't a recurring title. And I had an idea at the time. My, my then best friend was working for me, and she sat in the office with me in my home office. She sat in the office and was bemoaning the fact that 
Christmas vacation from school was coming up shortly, and her two kids, who then were very young, would be home for two weeks, and she didn't know how she was going to keep them entertained. So that gave me the idea that there could be a one-shot <clears throat> magazine for keeping kids occupied when they're bored. And it was getting too close to Christmas to get the magazine written and edited and put together and published, printed the whole works by Christmas. But I thought, well, we could bring it out for Easter, for Easter vacation. So I proposed it to the publisher, and they thought about it, but ultimately they turned the idea down. Now, I was, as a freelance editor, I was paid by the issue. Rather than getting a weekly salary, I was paid for every magazine issue that I edited. Now, if I would have brought the idea to some other publisher, they probably would have taken the idea and run with it, but left it to one of their own regular editors to put it together, and I would have got nothing out of the idea. So I uh, thought about it and thought about it, and I proposed it to a couple of other people who I thought I could trust but got nowhere, and I said, damn, this is too good an idea to let go of. Maybe I need to turn it into a book. Now, back in 1993, there was not the plethora of activity books for kids that exists today. So it was still something of, if not a brand new idea, still a novel enough idea that uh, people could um, grab onto it and be enthused. So I, I put it together as a book instead of a magazine and started sending it around. And I sent the first copies of it to three or five, I don't remember now, different publishers, and one of the first ones that I sent it to grabbed on it. I get this phone call, I'm sitting at my desk editing, and the phone rings and I answer it, and I hear, is this Cynthia McGregor? And I say yes, and I hear... This is Hilary Siggy with Berkeley Publishing. I'm calling about your book, Mommy, There's Nothing to Do. Have you placed it anywhere else yet? Well, at this point, I'm jumping out of my seat. I'm so excited. And I try to sound calm, cool, and collected. And I say, uh, no, it's still available. And she says, we'd like to make an offer. So that was my first book. And uh, my second book, a follow-on, was another activity book. And my third book was a book of games, which somebody in the publicity department, in their infinite wisdom, and yes, I'm being sarcastic, decided, <laughs> decided that although I had called it Great American Games, they were going to retitle it Totally Terrific Family Games. And I objected. I said, it's not just family games. It's games for adult parties. It's games for church uh, field days and school field days. It's You're limiting your audience by calling it totally terrific family games. And they said, well, yes, but family is a key word that's selling books these this year. And I said, yes, but you're limiting your audience. And they said, sorry, we're calling it totally terrific family games. Well, the book flopped. It was a major disaster. The end of my association with Berkeley Publishing. But from there, I went on to write other books for other publishers. I next shot over to what was called then Carol Publishing, which no longer exists. And I wrote books for kids why do people die? Why do we need another baby? Why do we have to move? And from there, I went to Rosen Publishing and wrote a series of books for kids on safety. And then I started writing books for adults. 
I wrote some parenting books. I wrote other things. I don't even remember now over a hundred books later who can remember everything there was. <laughs> yeah. But it's it's amazing because I was actually going through your list of books that you've written and you've got a list of fiction, nonfiction, adult books, parenting books, cookbooks, kids books, Christmas books, and now you say games and things like that. Which genre speaks to you the most from all of them? What do you, you know, find pleasure in writing in? I think the inspirational, motivational books and also the cookbooks. And why would that be? Well, I enjoy writing the inspirational, motivational books because I enjoy inspiring and motivating people. I'm a motivated person myself and I like uh, spreading the message. And as far as cookbooks, I enjoy cooking. Not as much as I used to. I'm slightly disabled now, Griselda. I'm getting around the kitchen is not as easy for me as it used to be. And so cooking isn't as much of a joy as it used to be. But I still enjoy cooking and uh, writing the cookbooks uh, is enjoyable because I enjoy food. I enjoy cooking and I enjoy eating. Mm. And and of all these books that you've written, where is like what's your source of um, knowledge? You know, is that your own knowledge that you're using into these books, or have you done research on some of them? And and how how does it work? How how do you get your knowledge for it? Well, some of the books are all out of my own knowledge, and others of the books are research. There there's some of each. And and tell us about your writing process. Are you a scheduled writer where, you know, you've said, I'm going to dedicate a few hours in the day to writing, or it just comes spontaneously with you? How does it work for you? Well, I get up in the morning, usually between two and three in the morning, and I get into my office, which is a room in my home, and I answer email. There's always a lot of email that came in overnight. And then I read the morning paper, which I read online. I read the e-edition rather than the print edition. And then I visit certain websites that I check every day. And then um, I, I get to work. And work may be writing a book or work may be writing a magazine article or work may be writing something for a client or work may be editing and my day may consist of some of all of those and I work till well depending what I'm I, I do take time out to take a nap and uh, depending what I'm cooking for dinner I might stop at 3 30 and get dinner started and then get back to work or I might work till four o'clock and then just to take off and start cooking, or I might work till five o'clock if I'm reheating leftovers or something. I can just work till five o'clock and then stop. But by five o'clock, I've had it. And and I hear that they call you the Energizer Bunny because you've got lots of energy. So where yes. do you find this motivation from? Darn if I know, Criselda. I just I love my work. I love what I do. And I, I just don't stop going. And so people call me the Energizer Bunny. Now, you're over in uh, Belgium, if I'm not mistaken. So you may yeah. not be familiar with the commercials. I don't watch TV myself, except for a half hour of news every night on the BBC, uh, which is broadcast on our public uh, broadcasting stations. And that doesn't have commercials. So I'm not exposed to the commercials either, but the Energizer Bunny commercial has been running for a very long time, and I have seen it. And it's a it's a little pink battery powered rabbit uh, toy. Yeah, I know it. You've seen it, okay? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and it just keeps going and going and going, and that's why people call me the Energizer Bunny because I just keep going and going and going. Wow. So what are you working on at the moment? Well, I'm working on several things at the moment. First, I am working on a book about the game of stickball. And second, I am working on a book 
of uh, people who had unhappy first marriages or other relationships or even happy marriages that were terminated by the early death of their spouse and who found happiness a second time around. And I am editing a book for a client, which I don't feel comfortable divulging the contents of at this time, but I am editing a book for him that is composed of vignettes. And as he sends me the vignettes, I edit them, so I can't sit down and edit the whole thing at one shot because I don't have the whole thing. It's coming in in dribs and drabs. So I'm editing it as we go along. And uh, so I'm working on that. And then I've been working on a few articles for a local magazine that I write for. It's a monthly magazine in the South Florida area. And I've been writing a few articles for them. And uh, I'm helping a client whose book I edited is a children's book, an illustrated a picture book. And uh, she, the, the illustrator for her, I, I, I hooked her up with a good illustrator, but the illustrator keeps making mistakes. She's good. She's really good. But she keeps making little mistakes in the text which she put in for the writer on the pages, and, and she's messed up a number of things. And I, I have been working on correcting the page proofs for my client. And just last night I got asked if I was interested in writing some promotional materials for a new client, so I may be hooked up with them soon, I'm not sure yet. And a former client has come back with a new project that he has me working on, editing promotional materials and writing promotional materials for him. I think that's most of what I'm working on currently. I <laughs> like that's a lot. That's a lot of work that you're doing for the moment. Yes. yes. Well, it keeps me on my toes. Wow, oh my God, it's amazing. So, tell me, you started writing um, in 1993. I'm pretty sure there was a transition then that happened from, you know, writing in a book or on paper to, to getting it digitalized, which we are doing right now. So, how did that transition work for you? And, and how do you write now? Do you still write on a paper or do you actually use the computer to do most of your writing or do you do it audio? How do you do it? I do it all on computer back in 1993. I still was, well, I had a computer back then too. Um, I've had a computer since 1983. So I had one of the earliest Apple IIe's. So I've been working on a computer since 1983. And before that, I was working on a typewriter, of course. Mm -hmm. And, um, of course, back then I wasn't writing books. I was writing articles and poems and, oh, Lord, whatever I thought of. I've been, I've been writing in some way or another since I could spell C-A-T. But, of course, I wasn't writing to sell things when I was six years old. I was just writing for the pure joy of writing. But when I was nine years old, um, I had the inspiration to write a play. Lord only knows what put that idea in my head. Nine years old. But I got the idea to write a play. Now, I wasn't sure of the difference between acts and scenes. So I wasn't sure if the play was in four acts or four scenes. And the title of the play totally telegraphed the outcome. So... It wasn't exactly what you call a professional effort, but mm -hmm. I wrote it anyhow just for because I've always just had to write it. It's within me. I, I need to express myself in writing. So nine years old, there I am. I co-opted the family typewriter, an old royal standard. This was before electric typewriters. 
I co-opted the family typewriter and the family bridge table, and I set up the bridge table in my room and the typewriter on the bridge table, and I started banging away at the keys and turned out this play in either four acts or four scenes, I wasn't sure which. And I don't know why I felt the need to hide it, but I did. I buried it under a pile of sweaters in my closet. Well, my mother must have, I mean, I hear I'm, now I'm surmising. I don't know this for a fact, but I mm. suspect that my mother found the play, and I, I had gone away to summer camp that summer, and I, I suspect without knowing for a fact that my mother found the play and contacted the camp directors, because all I know is the next thing, the drama counselor in camp asked all of us kids in our bunk if any of us had ever written a play. Well, my hand shot up in the air, waiting wildly. Me, 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 me. And uh, the drama counselor said, well, can I see it? And I said, um, it's back home. I'll have to write for it. So I wrote my mother or I called her. I don't remember. And I told her where the play was hidden, which, as I said, I suspect that she already knew. And I asked her to please send it up to me in camp. And I did, and I presented it to the drama counselor, and she okayed it. And she had the camp secretary uh, type it up and make copies on the mimeograph machine. And she cast the play. I was very disappointed that I didn't get the lead. And she said, well, it's not usual for the author of the play to also play the lead in the play, but she gave me a small part. And one of the proudest moments of my life was when the play was finished and, uh, you know, we put it on. And when, when it was over, some of the counselors had gone up by the tennis courts and picked a uh, bouquet of wildflowers, which they stood up in the in the audience and yelled, author, 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 and I took Aww. a bath, and they <laughs> threw the, uh, the, the, the wildflower bouquet up over onto the, over where the footlights would have been if the stage had had footlights, which it did not, and uh, threw the bouquet up to me, and it was one of the proudest moments of my life, and I really glowed, you know, so that was nine years old writing a play, but it took a while before I, I had anything. Well, I, I shouldn't say that. I had articles and stories published in the camp newspaper and a an organizational uh, newspaper for kids that I belong to, uh, things like that, you know. And then um, when I was, I guess, around 15, one of the local community weeklies uh, brought me on as what would now be called an intern. That In those days, the term intern only applied to doctors. They didn't speak of, of people working in, uh, in, in industry as interns. But what would now be called an intern, they brought me on board the, uh, the, one of the two local community weeklies and uh, had me writing articles on elk club meetings and brush fires and you name it. And uh, the, the other community weekly had a column called uh, The Cauldron, which highlighted good deeds done by teenagers. And I, the, the Cauldron columnist was going away to college and I wanted the column, and I contacted this other weekly newspaper and asked if I could switch alliances and leave the Herald and go to work for the record and uh, write the Cauldron column. And the editor said, uh, come over and do the same kind of thing you're doing now for the summer, and uh, if we like your work, 
we'll put you on as the Cauldron columnist. And I said, fair enough. And I quit the Herald and started writing for the record. Meanwhile, the editor fell down a flight of stairs and broke her back. And she had to stop working. They brought another editor in to replace her, and she didn't like me. So she put me to work writing obituaries. So my job every every Thursday, Thursday, Tuesday, whatever it was, I don't remember, once a week, I went into the record, the, uh, record office and said, and called all five of the local funeral homes and said, this is the South Shore record calling. Can you tell me who died this week? And then I got the information and wrote up the obituaries. But that was not a fun job for Zelda. And after a while, I quit. And uh, I wasn't paid for that, of course. That was just uh, for the experience, like any interning job today. And that was the end of that. But then I started selling little uh, articles for $5 here and $15 there. Nothing major and certainly nothing to live on. But it was a step up. At least I was getting paid. And from there, my career mushroomed. Wow, Cynthia, those are some amazing stories there. Um, so let me ask you my next question then. I know that you have ghostwritten many books for your clients. Does that figure that you mentioned earlier, that you've written over 100 books, does that include your ghostwritten works? No, it does not, Griselda. That figure of over 100 books is just books in my name and does not include ghost-written books and does not include books that I wrote pseudonymously. Uh, for a while in 2008, when the recession, the, the Great Recession hit uh, and my clients slacked off because they lacked money, I kind of was forced to write some erotic romances, and I didn't want those associated with my name. So I wrote those anonymously, pseudonymously, I should say, and they're not included in the figure of 100 books either. Uh, so you've written many, many books then, over 100, probably over 200 and some odd. Um, have you ever considered writing your autobiography? I have thought about it, but honestly, I don't know that my life would be that interesting that it would sell that well. Why not? The stories that you've just mentioned to me are amazing. But I don't think it would fill a whole book, those stories. Right? You know, yeah, I'm sure there are many more stories that you have to tell. Well, I don't know, Griselda. I, I'm not seriously considering it. Mm. Okay. You um, also do other work besides writing books, right? You've already mentioned some of them. Um, is there anything else that you'd like to mention on that? Well, I write for clients and I, I edit for clients. And if anyone wants to get in touch with me about writing ads or writing promotional copy or editing for them or ghost writing books for them, they can reach me through my web page, which is www dot cynthia mcgregor dot com and there's a contact link on the website and that would be the easiest way to get a hold of me and we can talk they can call me also but i don't know where they're calling from so it might be simpler for them just to uh contact me by email at first mm. okay i'll put a link to your uh website uh, in the description box of this episode as well, so that they can Thank click you. and get, yeah, that's fine, direct, direct access to you. Uh, Cynthia, when I mention healing through creativity, does that speak to you? Does that mean anything to you? Well, in one sense, yes. When I moved from New York to Florida in 1984, I uh, went into a depression, and I am not a depressive person, by nature, I'm, a, I'm an exuberant, joyful person by nature. But when I moved to Florida, I went into a, a very atypical depression. 
and I just moped around the house and spent a lot of time lying down and sleeping and daydreaming and oh I don't know I just couldn't get it together I was supposed to be writing an advice column for a magazine and I couldn't sit down and write the advice column I just I couldn't I couldn't do anything I was just barely getting through my days and finally one day I got up and sat down at the computer and just started writing whatever was on my mind uh, how I felt about the move to Florida and how I felt inside my depression the, the whole nine yards Griselda I just sat there and wrote for hours and when I got up I was healed I was all right so that's that's what healing through writing means to me healing through creativity other than that I don't have any thoughts but that's my my one expression my one experience of it mm, amazing story there what advice would you give a writer who wants to enhance their creativity or you know how can a writer keep themselves motivated what advice would you give them that's a tough one Griselda if a writer isn't motivated to write then there are several possibilities one is that they really weren't meant to write they just have a dream of what they think being a writer means and they want to have written and be published but they don't really want to write and if that's the case they're daydreaming and they should look elsewhere another possibility is that they're stuck because they they're afraid to sit down because they're afraid that what they write is going to turn out to be garbage trite glop schlock and in that case they need to face their fears and at least try and another possibility well those are the two biggest and then the third is that they just don't have the self-discipline that they think well today i'll start writing a book or an article or a story or a poem whatever and then they get distracted all oh, the fridge needs cleaning out all oh, the car needs to be taken for an oil change oh i'm meeting my friend for lunch all oh, this all oh, that and they just don't have the self-discipline in which case the answer really is just to discipline yourself if you have to set aside one hour a day to write if that's all you can do set aside one hour but don't let yourself get up from the computer for that hour say to yourself i'm going to get up an hour early before i go to work if you have a nine to five job or i'm going to set aside an hour in the evening or if you don't have a nine to five job but you're uh, raising small children when i put the kids down for a nap or when i put the kids to bed whatever i'm going to spend an hour at the computer and if that's all it is just an hour a day at least be productive in that hour and discipline yourself that's my advice that's that's very good advice um you know you have a uh, many authors these days that self-publish because it's become really easy to self-publish uh, your own book uh, what would you think would be some of the advantages or disadvantages of self-publishing compared to traditional publishing? Well, for one thing, with self-publishing, you'll never get stuck with a bad title, like the story I told you early in our conversation about Great American Games being turned into totally terrific family games and totally tanking as a book. <laughs> if you self-publish, you don't have anybody overriding your decision for title so that's one advantage another advantage to self-publishing is that you um get the book out in print a lot faster than if you were going with the traditional publisher who might take a year or more to get it into print another advantage is uh, more creative control altogether over the book. On the other hand, disadvantages include if you don't get an editor to edit the book, 
whether it's an editor that you find or an editor that the publishing entity supplies for you. If you don't get an editor to edit your book, the book can go out riddled with typos and misspellings and bad grammar and bad punctuation and make you look like an idiot. So that's one disadvantage. Now also you have more cover control in self-publishing, but then it may be on you, to, again, depending on how you self-publish, it may be on you to find a cover artist and maybe you won't find one who's good. Uh, but on the other hand, you do have more creative control over what the cover looks like. And um, so there's, there's pluses and minuses. Now you can self-publish through Amazon or you can self-publish through one of the um, self-publishing houses. I don't want, there are some very predatory self-publishing houses out there. I don't want to mention names because I don't want to be the re recipient of a lawsuit for defamation. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> but there are some very predatory companies out there. Now, I do do some work for a publisher that has a self-publishing arm and they're good. They don't rip people off, so I will mention their name. Their name is Marlboro Media, and they're the self-publishing division of Acute by Design, which is spelled as one word, A-C-U-T-E-B-Y-D-E-S-I-G-N, Acute by Design. You can find them on the web, and as I said, Marlboro Media is their self-publishing division, and they are an honest, honorable, non-rip-off outfit. And they're not the only one, I'm sure, but they're one that I have confidence in. Mm. So if I, you know, if I came to you with my manuscript and I'd, I'd given it to you and I'd tell you, could you please edit it for me, how long would it take you to, to get the edit done? Well, that depends on two things, Griselda. One is how long the book is. And the other is how much other work I have in-house at the time. Mm -hmm. I recently did the, well, it was a half editing, half ghostwriting job for another podcaster whose show I had been on. And she mentioned that she had been ripped off by a ghostwriter who had taken her money and then turned back the manuscript, the, the, the half, the notes and half finished manuscript to her and said, I can't work with this, but she didn't return the money either. And I said, that's ridiculous. That's unethical. And I would never do such a thing. Well, she wound up sending me the book and I had told her it would take three months, but it only took about one month. And, uh, she was delighted with my work. And she paid me, and uh, everybody went home happy. You know, mm. I I did a good job for her. She she was delighted. I got paid. I was delighted, and I did the work much faster than I expected. So uh, it was a win win situation. So it can take as little as a month as it did with her, or as much as three months if the book is longer and or has need of more correction if it's an editing job or if it's a ghostwriting job it would depend on how i get the notes toward the book is it fiction is it non-fiction am i getting all the information i need in note form and all i have to do is write a a proper book out of it or do i have to do research if i have to do research the price goes up the factors affect the price and the time both Griselda but mm -hmm. I would say basically I usually like to say three months and I usually bring the job in at less than that okay and and do you edit in a certain genre or are there genres that you don't like editing in like science fiction or or it doesn't matter 
I don't edit science fiction. I turned down a, a science fiction editing gig recently because I don't read science fiction. And so I'm not conversant with the um, conventions of the format of the genre. And so I don't feel competent to edit science fiction. I have edited a mystery, and I don't read mysteries either, but it was pretty easy to figure out what had to be done. You have to leave clues, but not, uh, not leave anything so blatant that the reader can figure it out on page one. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I have edited historical fiction, and I have edited a lot of nonfiction. I, I will edit most genres of both fiction and nonfiction, but I will not edit science fiction. And uh, has it ever been while you were editing that, you know, you're reading through the story or whatever, and you think that the ending is crap, let's say, and you think that a change needs to be made, would you actually convey this message to uh, to your client or would you just stay with what the you know what the author has written if i feel that a change needs to be made i'll say so and did recently the author decided not to make the change that i suggested and he went with his original ending but uh, i did make the suggestion i did not just go ahead and change it i would not do that but i did say to him look, uh, blah, 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 and I think you need to rethink what you've written there, you know? Okay. So tell me, Cynthia, how do you see the future? More of same. What I am really looking forward to for Zelda, and I hope it comes to fruition, I have a children's picture book, Christmas-themed, called Heartfelt the Special Reindeer, that was supposed to have been made into an animated TV special for this past Christmas. And for one reason and another, the first animator disappeared on us. And then the second animator said he couldn't get the animation done in time for the holiday. And so it just didn't happen for Christmas 2019. So now we're aiming at Christmas 2020, but I'm biting my fingernails on this one because the current animator has been displaced from his home studio and at the moment he's not able to work on the book, on the, on the animation of the book, and I'm nervous that we're going to miss the deadline again. And I'm really, really sweating it, Griselda. I'm really, really, I'm this, this is my dream. I, I really, really, really want to see this book turned into an animated half hour TV special. We've already laid down the voice tracks. I've written the lyrics to three songs, which have been set to music and recorded. And as I said, we've laid down the voice tracks. The actors all came into a studio and recorded the voice tracks. And so all that remains is for the animator to animate the show and make it match up with the voice tracks. And he's holding up the works. And I'm praying that we get this done in time to get it picked up by either a major network or a cable network, it'll probably be a cable network, and uh, shown on TV for Christmas 2020. So that's one thing, besides more of saying that's one thing new and different. And then another thing new and different is I a client came to me for help in writing a pilot episode of a TV series and I did help him write the pilot episode, and we presented it to another of my clients who has TV contacts, and he's supposed to be presenting it to producers to see if someone wants to produce the show and sell it to a network. And then if that happens, 
the client of mine whose concept this was says he wants me to co-write the episodes with him and then in the meanwhile all of this gave me the audacious idea to write a pilot for another TV show, another TV series, and the same, not the client for whom I wrote, co-wrote the pilot for his show, but the client who has the TV contacts is also going to show that one around. And the reason this is audacious is that I'm not a TV viewer. I don't watch TV. (laughs) Well, that's amazing. Oh, my God. And what's the difference between writing, uh, you know, an article or writing a book and writing a TV show? Or is it is it something to do with like screenwriting, you know, screenplays and things like that? Is it the same genre? It's very much like screenwriting and very much not like writing a book. It's very much like screenwriting. Yes. And how did you get the experience for that then? How did you learn how to write screenwriting? Because it's a different thing, right? I went online and found tutorials and studied. Oh, my! you're amazing. I mean, you, you do so much already, and then you're still going online and checking out other stuff, like hats off. I mean, amazing, hey, I, really. Hey, I'm the Energizer Bunny. Yeah, that's amazing. And I'm going to keep both my fingers crossed for you, and I'm Thank sending you. all my all my best wishes, you know, the best of luck to you, and I hope all these plans that you have for the TV shows and everything that they actually go through. But we'll stay in touch and you're going to let us know at a later date when it goes through. And uh, I'll be so happy to actually see it on TV or or video or whatever, you know. Thank you. Well done. Congratulations. Thank um, you. Yeah, no, it's really, it's amazing what you do. I mean, there's some people of my age that are, you know, when I look at them and the inspiration is at really below zero level. And then I look at you with all the energy and motivation that you have, it's it's awesome. It's amazing. And if everyone could actually learn from all that you've done and see what all you're still doing, it's like, you know, mind blowing. Thank you. Thank you. So, uh, Cynthia, it was lovely talking to you. I have a last question, but you already mentioned it. Uh, but I'd like to ask you again, how can our listeners contact you or find your books? And you already mentioned your website. I'm yes. going to put a link to it. Uh, is there you. any other thing? Is there any other thing you'd like to share with us? Well, I think we've about done it, Chris Elder, but I want to wish you good luck with all of your endeavors and with the the podcast and whatever else you're you're doing. And uh, best of luck to you. And if I can ever be of help to you, let me know. And as for your listeners... Uh, www.cynthiamacgregor.com. That's where to find my books. That's where to find me for ghost writing or other writing, for editing, whatever I can help you with. Okay? Sure. Thank you, Cynthia. Thank you so much for the wishes and hoping to see a movie on you soon that you've written. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Cynthia. Bye and have a lovely evening. Thank you, you too, Griselda. Bye-bye. Thank you, Cynthia. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you for joining us on The Three Pillars. See you next week and make it awesome. Awesome.